have you any questions on this budget change proposal? Let me have you go ahead and um, uh, we'll let's go ahead and see if there's uh, LAO or finance any comment on this budget change proposal. Any public comment on the CalFresh technical assistance? Let's do that. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman and members of the committee. Jessica Bartholo with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Uh, just really briefly, I want to uh, reflect on the questions uh, that you asked uh, with regards to the student work rule. Uh -huh. um, this is very concerning. We are seeing um, growing hunger in, among our college campuses, and that just doesn't result only in um, you know, in harm to students and, um, and indignity of hunger, but also contributes to their inability to finish uh, college, right? And these are the best and the brightest that have come out of poverty. We know education will help them um, stay out of poverty. And, um, and if they're unable to meet their basic needs, they're less likely to be able to graduate. So is that true? I was, what she shared with me, that it's a 20-hour work week requirement for students who are enrolled in college? That's correct. It's a federal law. Mm -hmm. um, we would love to partner uh, with the leadership here, mm -hmm. um, the budget committee, to, to make the request of our Congress to change that rule. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 even if you are receiving CalFresh benefits as an 18-year-old and headed on into college, um, you, you can't have that unless somebody else is willing to give you a job. Even if you have a work-study placement um, if there's not a work study job for you, um, if you're if you're eligible for work study, but you, there's no job for you, you don't you don't get those benefits. And, and, and it's a minimum of 20 hours a week. That's correct. Wow. Um, there is there was legislation passed by the legislature last year and being implemented um, for a target date of October 1st or before, um, if if it could happen, um, that would allow uh, that that would. Uh, make it clearer what kinds of um, exemptions are available to mm -hmm. college students in mm -hmm. California. There are some um, places in the law that the federal government gives exemptions, um, but doesn't, but, but requires the state to take action to define what those exemptions mean. And so that's what the legislature uh, asked uh, the, the department to do, and, and they'll be implementing with a stakeholder group. Yeah. And that was the Skinner Bill. That's correct, 1930, okay. maybe 1930. 1930. Yes. Um, so, but there are there are increasing opportunities and I think responsibilities, right, for uh, the department to be working with community colleges and mm -hmm. uh, UCs and and and, um, mm -hmm. and CSUs to find ways to reduce hunger, but also to increase opportunity, as Mr. Stone was saying, right? It's it's not enough just to say here's some food for you in a food stamp card, um, in a CalFresh card, but also to say how can we make sure that you don't have to come back to the office to ask for help. Um, the, of course, the fastest way to make sure that working families and, and uh, working students don't get um, don't go hungry is a, a high wage, a wage that doesn't leave them under the poverty or under um, low income. Um, but if we don't have that, we do need to be respectful and help them get there. I know that the, uh, the assistant director took a meeting with the chancellor's office and the community college association and Western Center and our partners to um, to help build some bridges between the community colleges um, work programs and the CalFresh work programs. And, and we, we commend them uh, publicly here for that. Um, and, uh, and, you know, just about the work, uh, the cliff effect, this is, this is a real thing. Um, additionally, I would say that the CalWINS program, which was implemented last year, which gives a $10 uh, extra benefit to working families who are meeting uh, TANF work rules right. and on CalFresh, um, that's maybe one step in the right direction. And in future years, perhaps we could look at that as another way to kind of lift the benefit um, of CalFresh recipients. Um, and uh, I, I, think, I think with that, uh, those are my concluding statements. I, I would just say that we've been, um, you know, we agree that the, the work that has been done by the horizontal integration um, uh, uh, and implementation of the student work rules, et cetera, um, and the BCP request to continue that work, uh, we do support it. Western Center um, it has been working with the department and continue, will continue to do so and would appreciate your I vote in that, in that uh, request. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Asley, and I'm with the Coalition of California Welfare Rights Organizations. Uh, the dashboard has been around for about a year, and, it's, and it demonstrates a lot of churning. Churning is when people who are, who are churned off of uh, CalFresh, and then they come back because it was wrong. They just uh, they didn't provide some document or something like that. It was a, more of a technical reason that they were that they were that came off the program and come back on, and the churning is very high in Los Angeles County, but the dashboard only shows one percent. 
And I get a lot of calls from Los Angeles County people who have been cut off, and it's all because they couldn't do to complete their recertification. Uh, the biggest barriers to participation is the paperwork, and also there's a lot of flexibility that the department has. There's what they call state options. And a lot of times those state options could be positive or negative. And there's no real comprehensive list of all of the various flexibilities that the department has and which one they've selected and which one they haven't. And finally, regarding uh, horizontal integration or basically when a person applies for Medi-Cal for on ACA, it has a question, do you want food, do you want Cal Fresh? If you answer yes, that does not start the beginning date of your aid. You have to, uh, next week you have to try to get down to the county and then apply in the county, then that's when it starts. So it uh, should start from the date that you answer yes, that's when your application should start. And that's what we need to do if we want to increase participation. Are there any other of the entitlement programs where coverage starts on date of application? Oh, Cal, Cal Fresh, Cal Works, Medi, Medi-Cal. Okay. Yeah, Medicaid goes back from, I mean, if you apply on the 28th, it starts from the, the beginning first. of the first of the month. Got it, okay. It, it's that that doesn't constitute an, an application. I get Just it. that piece, I get but it. yes. Yeah. I get it. But then that's some of the challenges, you know, with, I forgot whose bill it was, where we're trying to combine the Cal Fresh app with the student free and reduced lunch app. And so it's all of these administrative barriers, which is can you put a check mark? When can it start? Can the information be shared? The data be shared from one state agency to another? That's really frustrating when, as my father would say, Stevie Wonder could see that the family qualifies for the program, <laughs> you know? But it's all of these, you know, combining with federal regulations. And, and Senator Stone, it was my impression, I don't know why, I may have just made it up, that, that your constituent may not have been a former CalWORKs recipient. Right. Right. And so it's, it's, it's not just former CalWORKs recipients, but it's the working poor who do qualify for some of these aided programs right. and how we eliminate the cliff effect for them. Right. And if they had children, they would have been eligible for what Ms. Bartholo mentioned, the $10 wins payment right. that we haven't really featured here. It kind of falls between CalWORKs and CalFresh. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's exactly that. It's for families with children on CalFresh, not on CalWORKs, to supplement their income. And it also affects our WPR calculations, very important for that, but it is assistance as well to just the kinds of families we were talking about. Although those were older adults without children, it would not apply to them. I'll entertain a motion to uh, follow the staff recommendation, which is to approve the trailer bill language, uh, excuse me, the budget change proposal language, item number 11. Thank you, accepted uh, by all three of us, great. Let's move into uh, your drought food assistance program, the um, informational if presentation. To the second, if you flip through to the second to last page, uh, I have a few bullet points on, on, the, on the drought program, but let me, um, let me just talk about it a little bit with you. Um, uh, it, the drought food assistance program was developed as part of a, the response to the to the governor's drought emergency declaration and to subsequent legislation enacted. Um, the governor's drought task force in developing the program um, originally, and I'll talk about how it was changed more recently, um, but how it was developed originally was we looked at the USDA drought monitor and we identified counties with extreme or exceptional drought. Well, that's 56 of the 58. Um, amongst those 56, we then took a closer look at which counties had above average unemployment and which counties had above average agricultural share of, uh, of employment in, within their county. And based on those two criteria, we arrived at essentially 24 counties that met, that met those. Um, we then, to, uh, to be efficient, we elected to leverage our existing infrastructure. Um, California operates um, the federal, um, they call it the T is the, the, the Emergency Federal um, Assistance, food, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, or TFAP. Uh, we operate that in California. That, that's where essentially excess commodities uh, flow down to um, the food banks, um, most of it flowing through our sort of main contractor here in Sacramento, Food Link. They're out at the old Army Depot. Um, and essentially, we use that same infrastructure. So what we did is um, we um, contracted with Food Link to essentially buy the food, 
package the food. We had, a, we had an inclusive process with the food banks about what the content of those boxes should be. Uh, I think the handout talks a little bit about what's in there. Um, they're 25 pound boxes. They pack neatly. Um, they fit on a pallet, and in terms of in terms of working with the food banks, um, this is what they preferred. They want they wanted a simple box that they could distribute. Um, so that's how we that's how we developed the boxes. The county the, the food banks at their end, we said what's in order in order to become a full participant in the program, they had to turn in a drought action plan. What was their plan for distributing food to the farm worker communities and the affected individuals? Once they had that in place. Um, we then basically uh, started the delivery process. And to date, we've delivered um, uh, 600,000 boxes have actually been delivered um, to individuals. Um, um, that, that represents over 300,000 households picking up. I can't tell you that it's 300,000 unduplicated. Sometimes it's the same household coming the next month. Um, uh, in terms of who's eligible for DFAP, it is a self-certification process which mirrors the self-certification process for the federal program that I just mentioned. You need to come in, sign in, and basically state that um, you, are, you are either unemployed or underemployed due to the drought and the food that you essentially just state your address and um, that you intend to consume the food, you're not going to resell it. And um, those are our requirements. They're very similar to, to, the, to the federal version. Um, I think in your second question, you're asking about what's happening with the, um, uh, with the new counties. Um, so chapter one, statutes of 2015, um, was, was, was major drought legislation that essentially added 17 million to the program. Uh, with that seven, it also added legislative intent to include Imperial, Riverside, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties um, to the program. We, um, We've been in touch with those counties, and they have all submitted drought action plans, and we're in the process of approving those, and we would expect um, to begin deliveries uh, sometime in May. With the additional $17 million, um, we believe we have sufficient funding to continue the program through June of 16, in other words, through the, through the entire upcoming budget year, um, and, and also including um, adding on this group of counties. That, that's a rough estimate. Um, because essentially we're looking at our typical pace of moving 50 to 60,000 food boxes a month. There is some variance month to month, um, and we don't know exactly how um, our five new counties are going to look in terms of a demand pattern and, and, and how their distributions will go. But our, our estimate is we think, we, we think we're good through June of 16. Um, and I'll just say one, one more thing about the program. Um, the, the, the Tulare Basin, which is the counties of Kern, uh, why am I going? Kern, Tulare, Kings, and Fresno. That area is where most of the food demand has been and where the food distribution networks have been set up. Um, Tulare had some very innovative, and so did Fresno, in terms of actually having off-site deliveries. Generally, generally, this is not come to the central food bank to get your box. It's more of an out in the community. And whenever possible, Food Link tries to support that. Sometimes the Food Link truck will arrive at that remote site, help there, Unload there, um, and then and then whatever isn't taken at that site, then it goes to the central food bank for for a future drought distribution. Um, so we think it's an effective program um, uh, using existing leveraging existing infrastructure and resources where we can. Your expectation or or um, finance that um, this will be a program that will continue indefinitely uh, as we continue to experience historic drought levels. Um, I wouldn't have said, I wouldn't say indefinite, but mm -hmm. I think ex well, the, your second clause about experiencing drought. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was always intended to be temporary, but um, with uh, with the increasing drought um, and the action by the legislature and the obvious and, need, yeah, yeah, which is For, staggering. I mean, our our goal of the program has always been to meet the need. If a food bank um, sees in their allocation that they don't think they have enough. Um, we tell them to call and we, we, we adjust that. We either let them borrow against their next allocation or we, um, or we do have a set aside. We try, we try to move stuff around. So our, our goal is to meet the need. Thank you. Yes. Brandon Nunes with Finance. Um, Mr. Bland's correct. And I just add on it. It is something that we continue to look at in future budgets. It does take us through 15, 16, but of course, the drought is, you know, a big issue that, of course, we're looking at. And right. if the need continues into future budgets, we'd be looking at that. Okay, excellent. Any questions? Yes, Senator Mani. Just on, on the handout, it indicates one of these boxes serves a household of four for four to five days. 
at the distribution points, can a family get more than one box? Um, yes, they can. Time? I yeah. think the average typically is two boxes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes distributions are happening more than once a month. It really does vary by county. But it, but I don't want to pretend that it, it alone would allow a family with no other food resources. It, it, it's not enough. Right. It, 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 it's part of a package. And of course, we're always hoping, and there are Cal, CalFresh outreach uh, flyers um, are, are part of the program as well. So it is intended to be supplemental, and hopefully most of these families should be eligible for the Many should be Cal eligible Fresh. for CalFresh as right. well. Thank you. All right. Any public comment on the drought food assistance program? Two minutes, please. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Andrew Shane from the California Association of Food Banks. We represent 42 food banks, um, so not all of the, the DFAP distributors, but many of them. Um, and just a, a couple of points. First, I just want to thank the department, um, thank the legislature um, for a number of things. For, um, as Ms. Mr. Bland said, um, when it comes to the department, the allocation process has been very successful. It's been nimble. It's been you know, forward thinking in the sense of very good communication, regular calls with the food banks, so people know what's happening on the ground. We're able to measure the demand. We're able to look at it over time. And, you know, we're very happy to say that, that no food bank has ever run out of food. And that's very important because you need to set the expectation. People can come and get this food. I mean, this, this is a really desperate situation. So very thankful for that. I do want to underscore that. Um, and I also wanted to, to thank the legislature, um, especially for AB 91. Um, and, you know, I really do appreciate the comments around the dynamic nature of, of the drought, right? Um, and so one thing that I think we should be thinking about is the need to continue to monitor the drought situation. As we know, if you just look at the raw numbers, we could be even looking at 56 out of 58 counties. But, of course, you know, we've been, you know, dealing with, with constraints in terms of how much money can we put to this program. But I think that especially as we begin to implement drought-related restrictions in, in urban areas especially, we should be thinking about how this is affecting the need for food. I mean, thinking about um, industries such as recreation, landscaping, pools. I mean, there's other ways besides agriculture that we can think about folks who are economically displaced and hungry um, be because of the drought. Um, and just in quick response to some of the, the questions that came up, um, I really do, uh, 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 Senator Monning, appreciate your question. So most food banks are supplementing with fresh produce. Um, of course, these boxes need to be shelf stable, um, and so that is helping, you know, to meet basic sustenance needs. But I, uh, if I could only uh, show some pictures, I mean, there's really wonderful produce distributions happening. There are also CalFresh outreach um, workers often on site. I know in Kings County, they're actually bringing up one of the trailers, as Mr. Uh, Bland mentioned, right to the, the county office to try and make that as seamless as possible. Um, and um, utilities, Red Cross, I mean, really, it's become a, a community hub in a lot of those, those places. So. Yes, Jessica Bartholow again with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Um, just to highlight that we would like to continue to see uh, the verification of how somebody is identified as a, a victim of drought to be facilitated. It should be as easy as possible, right, to identify that you are a victim of drought. And this is a general uh, comment. It, it comes up a lot every time we have a disaster. How do you identify that you are a victim of that disaster? Um, secondly, um, we support uh, the ongoing uh, funding for this work, but it's not going to be enough. As you pointed out, uh, uh, Senator Monning, this is supplementary. We need our partners from the USDA, from the federal government, from Congress, from the Senate to help put more money into disaster. This is a disaster. It's not the same type of disaster that the East Coast has, but it doesn't mean that they should be able to turn their backs as easy um, to the needs of hungry Californians that are hurting from the disaster. Um, and uh, just to highlight some of the work we're, do we're doing in partnership, we're, uh, we're working on a, on a letter to Congress. Uh, we'd love all the help we can get um, to urge, that would urge then the administration to use the flexibility they have to bring um, summer lunch money uh, to homes so that homes can purchase money during the summer uh, months. And we've, uh, we're partnering with the California Association of Food Banks, and we have several uh, partners, including Western Growers, um, the retailers, the grocers, um, and, and several packing and, um, and farm industry. So, um, I, you know, we just as an invitation to all of us to be asking our federal partners to be creative in the ways that we can help hungry families in California. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Let's, that was informational colleagues. Let's move on to proposals for investment. I'm sure. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Monning. I mean, Senator Stone. <laughs> okay. Um, it just uh, kind of just spurred my interest that, well, first of all, uh, 
the the quickness that you got this program going, I, I just want to commend you. Mm -hmm. uh, Five hundred and sixty thousand boxes uh, in April, uh, I think, is uh, it was quite a yeoman's task, and so I want to compliment you for um, that that quick quick turnaround. We talked about uh, you know uh, those that are eligible for CalFresh and those that are not subscribed for, and we're trying to figure out how we're going to boost those percentages. Is this an appropriate population that we're trying to educate that are getting these boxes that we do have CalFresh available? And while this is a supplement, we have a potential right. solution to their, their family's problems during this economic crisis. Right. It, it, we, we want them to apply for CalFresh as well. I, it, I think it varies by county. Mm -hmm. We don't have exact data. The, the, it, it, it is a self-certification process at the pickup. Um, we don't we don't insist that you apply for CalFresh no, or show us a CalFresh application in order to get the that's food. That's what I was going for. I was yeah. hoping we made aware. We make uh, them aware, yes. Of the program right. that they may yes. not be aware that's there that right. could further help them. Right. I, I'm hoping we're taking advantage of yeah. that opportunity. We are people. we are working with our outreach contractors and the, and the food banks there as an we, we view it as an opportunity. And I think uh, Mr. Shane uh, talked Shanefeld talked about um, an effective program in Kings. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's uh, invite the advocates up for the proposals for investment. Uh, we're hearing two colleagues under State Emergency Food Assistance Program and Nutrition Incentive Program market match. While they're doing that, uh, Senator Monning, if you would please weigh in on your position on uh, the first agenda item under Child Department of Child Support Services, TBL 606. I'm going to approve on that. Thank you very much, sir. So it's unanimous. Oh, Mr. Cook, do me a favor. I was going to ask Mr. Cook, and I, I looked up and he moved too fast. See this mic right here on the podium? Just push it down, because that's all I see when I look at it, the public testifying. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. We're going to hear about the State Emergency Food Assistance Program. We're going to hear from Andrew... Shane. Shane, of course it is. Course. Policy Director of the California Association of Food Banks. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and members. Um, well, I think this is the, the right context, right? We've been having a conversation yes. about CalFresh. I really appreciate the questions about um, the, the participation, right? Because we're in the context where one in six Californians are food insecure, right? I mean, staggering numbers mm -hmm. that I know that you all know. Um, I would want to highlight um, really briefly that in Los Angeles County, the food bank just completed their Map the Meal Gap. and it's the county, maybe this is no surprise in terms of raw numbers, the largest uh, food insecure population in the country, a million and a half people in Los Angeles County alone. Um, and that million and a half includes 600,000 children, one in four kids in, in Los Angeles County. So I think it's just important to keep in mind what we're dealing with here. Um, and at the same time, I wouldn't be here in terms of this proposal for investment if we weren't as an organization involved in that CalFresh conversation. We are one of the state's primary outreach contractors. Um, and we work hard every day with the department, with the counties, with other advocates to really try and maximize participation and draw down those 100 percent federally funded benefits. Right. Feed Californians, bring in those resources to our, our communities. Um, but we know that that's not meeting the need, whether it's the drought food assistance program or whether it's it's CFAP, the state emergency food assistance program. So CFAP was begun in 2011 by AB 152 from Mr. Fuentes, and it's been funded um, by temporary um, donations from the assembly, and we're very grateful to them um, for those resources. Um, but what we need is stable, ongoing support for this program. What CFAP does is it provides money to the TFAP uh, uh, agency in each county, which is almost always food banks, but it's not always. Sometimes it's a county human services agency. And what it allows them to do is to buy commodities that are only California foods um, and then provide them to their neighbors in need, right? So this is a win-win. This is providing resources for our food banks to maximize their economies of scale and to purchase California foods supporting our agriculture sector. So just to give you a sense of the impact of this program, statewide, Food banks are able to use their tremendous purchasing power to provide five meals for every dollar. I mean, you just can't match that kind of stewardship for state resources when we're talking about the overwhelming hunger need in our communities. Um, I would just close by saying that if you look at other states, our request for $5 million is really quite modest. Um, and I have some more information if you're, if you're interested. But just to look at one other state that's, you know, really illustrates this comparison, Ohio. 
Right. So Ohio has approximately two million food insecure persons, whereas California has more than six million. Right. So in that context, they have a $13 million state budget for their emergency food assistance program. Where we've only had one. This means that their annual expenditure per person is more than six dollars, whereas ours has only been 15 cents. And this is in a context where their SNAP participation, their, their CalFresh, is at 88 percent. And as, as we just heard, we're only at 63 percent. Right. So this shows the gap that we have in our state. And again, um, CFAP is only part of the solution. We're doing everything we can to maximize CalFresh. But until we get there, we need to look at programs like this that we that we know are really helping move the needle on ending hunger in California. How do you define food insecurity? So food insecurity is defined when um, folks answer a series of questions, and these have been verified by USDA, that they don't have the economic resources to know that they are able to purchase food. And it's defined either you know, within that month, within that year. There's sort of different timelines in which that, that question is asked. Um, it's sort of commonly referred to as, you know, you don't know where your next meal is coming from. And of course, that, that's, often, that's often the case um, for, fo for folks on the ground. And um, it, well, that's, that's a better way to put it. That's, that's really what, what, it, what it gets at. Thank you. If I may add, the California Health Interview Survey defines food insecurity as the inability to or the inability to have a consistent ability to afford enough food so the consistency is another element to that example fold who 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 is so the California to whom is the survey, is is the survey given? Mm -hmm. Is the representative population of, of California? Got uh, it. And we can provide those data to you. So it's not just through, um, it, it's, it's a broad kind of catchment. It's not just through um, welfare offices or, see what I'm saying? Yeah, that's right. This, this is a, um, a, a random sample that provides that's, an accurate um, those are the words portion of the state. That's right. Excellent. Any questions? Senator Monning. Well, just kind of an add on to that. I know. In some of the diabetes prevention programs in my region with low-income families, the first question they ask is if, they, if they're eligible for CalFresh is whether that uh, carries them through the month mm -hmm. in the vast majority. Right. If not everyone in those, in those gatherings, um, it doesn't. And so they, after they exhaust the CalFresh allocation, they are dependent on either food banks or other forms of charity mm -hmm. uh, to provide food. So it makes planning very difficult, mm -hmm. and it drives the use of the buying power of CalFresh to getting often uh, less healthful foods because they're going for stretching mm -hmm. the dollar, mm -hmm. and so uh, more uh, less fresh foods. Um, Anything in your programs that I know in some farmers markets, uh, they they will provide a multiplier. If you present with your CalFresh allocation, you get extra buying power. Are those programs dependent on state support? What's the status of those? And here is our transition to market match. Thank okay. you, Senator Monning. Good. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the handoff, Senator yeah, Monning. Sure. <laughs> So my name is Justin Rouse. I'm the policy director for Roots of Change, which is a food systems nonprofit. And I'm speaking here today on behalf of uh, 128 organizations who support the creation of a statewide nutrition incentive matching grant program. This program is built on the evidence-based success of a five-year-old program that you're referring to in your district. Um, what it does is it doubles the purchasing power of CalFresh benefits when spent on healthy fruits and veggies at farmers markets. So. In that way, it's a win-win for CalFresh clients because then they can extend the dollar to actually buy healthy fruits and vegetables. But then also for our rural farming economies because certified farmers markets are California growers. And so the dollars, these federal dollars then with this additional incentive cycle within local economies and also for the state. So in 2013, more than a third of Californians found themselves below 200% of the federal poverty level, which is the income cutoff for CalFresh. Approximately, so Andrew mentioned one in six Californians are food insecure, but if you just look at that population alone, that rate jumps up to 42% of low income Californians who are food insecure. Uh, to make matters worse, according to the Centers for Disease Control, 60% of California's adult 
population is overweight or obese. And people in poverty are also disproportionately overweight or obese. And as you heard from the earlier presentation, there's a big overlap between CalFresh and Medi-Cal population. So that puts the state on the hook for these preventable diet-related diseases. Um, if CalFresh reached 100% of the eligible population, we could inject 62 million of additional sales tax revenue uh, for the state general fund and 29 million for county budgets. So the U.S. Department of Agriculture has shown that every dollar in SNAP generates a dollar and 79 cents in economic activity. Our own LAO has even said that CalFresh benefits help generate revenue for local and state governments. So our budget proposal for the Nutrition Incentive Matching Grant Program uh, would better leverage these federal CalFresh dollars uh, for our state's agricultural sector as well as our low-income folk. Ongoing evaluation of market match uh, which is the model that Senator Monning was talking about that serves the model for this proposal, shows that demand for nutrition incentives far outweighs the supply, even though it has real, very real benefits, like a six-fold return on investment. Um, it can also lead to job creation in farming communities and promote healthier shopping habits. In Humboldt County, the county uh, welfare office actually used market match as a vehicle to boost enrollment, um, to your question earlier, Senator Stone. So this is why our, but we are asking for a modest investment of $5 million per budget year for this statewide nutrition incentive matching grant program. Um, California can't afford to leave even more federal money on the table. This time it's provided through this new program in the 2014 Farm Bill called the Food and Security Nutrition Incentive Program, or FINI for short. This provided $100 million in matching dollars over a five-year window. Uh, we missed the first two years of that money, so there's 65 million in federal matching dollars remaining now uh, for us to try to take advantage of at the state level. General fund support would increase the likelihood that we can maximize California's share. From the first round of funding, what we saw, the biggest application nationally came from a statewide applicant from Washington State Department of Public Health. They were able to draw down almost six million from those federal matching dollars. Uh, so now there's precedent for what we are trying to propose here in California. Uh, so I just want to thank you for your time and attention and hope you can find as much value in this program as the California farmers, the California families who have experienced it, and especially those who haven't been able to um, benefit from these types of nutrition incentives because the program has operated more at a pilot local scale through different parts of the state. Thank you for your time. Senator Romani. Yeah, just to follow up, and I'm sorry if I missed this, but in how many counties has the pilot been um, operating? Do you know? I do know. Or just roughly, if you don't have Roughly it right. around 25 counties. Mm -hmm. um, and they're at around 150 farmers markets, whereas we have a little over 700 farmers markets in the state. And as I recall, we passed legislation that permits a farmer's market to accept um, the, the authorization. Um, EBT. EBT, thank you. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, but it doesn't mandate it. Is that that's still the status, right? A farmer's market can choose whether or not they want to participate. Right, yeah. And this, this program also kind of um, <laughs> promotes the adoption of that technology because uh, the way that the incentives have worked in market match in the state is someone will come with their EBT, they'll swipe it at the POS system, and what will happen is they'll get tokens or script in return. So then the growers who are at the market know that when they see these script, they're used for these products, the healthy fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I think it's a great program. Me too. And um, it's just a win-win for everybody. It, it, mm -hmm. it encourages our local agricultural mm -hmm. production and, you know, close farm to consumer um, transfer. And, and it does, if families can get more, mm -hmm. they're gonna be drawn to the farmer's markets and, and buying more healthful foods. So I think it's a great plan. I agree, Senator Stone. But Madam Chair, I just wanted to also, I think it's a great program. You mentioned uh, you've got about 100 um, farmer's markets out of roughly 700 that you've found in the state of California. And uh, certainly the goals of your program is to, to market it to the other 600. 
um, because we, we talked about that the demand is greater than our ability to supply at this time, right? Correct. So, yeah. um, and Riverside County is a large agricultural mm -hmm. county with a lot of farmers markets, and uh, I would love for you to send me the information so I can help market for you in our county because we have, of course, you know, a growing growing need there as well. But we mm -hmm. have a, and we have a lot of produce that's being generated out of our county. So I appreciate your efforts there. I'd be happy to. I'm actually born and raised in Riverside, so oh. yeah. <laughs> This just hit me. Um, we're talking about the actual farmers markets. What about the, um, and I don't even know if these programs still exist. Uh, I experienced it 20 some years ago here in Sacramento where you could sign up for the delivery um, of in season fresh fruits and vegetables. Okay. I signed up, I want to say through the co-op here in Sacramento. Community supported agriculture boxes. Exactly. Boxes. Exactly. Can you use uh, your CalFresh or Food Match for those kinds of programs? 